Hey, all you cool cats and kittens. It's your favorite history teacher back at you again with another historical video today. We got a we got a big topic. Um, two big topics for for instance, Vietnam and the civil rights movement. So uh, let's get into it. So uh, again, with this darker shade of background, red just doesn't really pop. So uh, this color, this like, this color, this dark turk, no, this like turquoise, light green, light blue green, whatever you want to call it. Um, that's what you'll be highlighting and sad to say. <laughs> uh, a majority of this entire lecture is highlighted um, because it's it's such an important change in American history that it it's got to be talked about. It's got to be known. So here we go. All right. So. Like I said, I, I told you, I told you. So this light green, this this color is what you need to write down. So expanding the liberal state, um, drawing back from, I mean, uh, FDR's New Deal. Um, we have liberal programs, liberal policies, uh, instituted during this time in America. And it uh, first started with the election of 1960. You have our boy, John F. Kennedy, a Democrat, uh, versus uh, sitting U.S. Vice President Richard Nixon. And the TV will play an important role in this election, uh, as well as radio. People who saw on TV the election, the the debates, thought Kennedy was an was a great orator and winner, but the people who listened on the radio thought Nixon. It turns out to one of the closest presidential elections in U.S. history, and Kennedy wins. And his um, policies, his programs, are named the New Frontier. Um, and it focused on urban renewal, civil rights, and health care. Um, following him uh, is Lyndon B. Johnson's Great Society. Great Society. Uh, he focused on domestic programs, including civil rights, poverty, and education. Basically, it's the New Deal plus civil rights. Uh, he also put, uh, declared a war on poverty in America and created the Office of Economic Opportunity, which would administer money to various programs in areas of the country, particularly low income areas. You have two programs that are still around today, Medicare, which is medical assistance and insurance for elderly Americans and Medicaid, which is healthcare for lower income families and individuals. All right, Medicare, Medicaid, know the difference. And then you have the housing and urban development, uh, which is a cabinet position, HUD, which is still around today as well. And um, it was created for under LBJ. And when I say LBJ, I ain't talking about LeBron James. All right, Lyndon B. Johnson. And uh, again, the housing HUD will focus on urban development and renewal. So here's a televised debate on from the Nixon and Kennedy debates. And here is the Department of Housing and Urban Development. So expanding the liberal state, um, we have the Immigration Act of 1965, which eliminated those quotas from the 1920s under the Quota Act um, in 1921. The impact of the Great Society, several programs are still around today, much like, you know, the New Deal. Poverty was reduced during the 1960s. 
but the war on Viet the war in Vietnam and the Great Society would compete with each other to get government funds, and that is the push pull factor, uh, the tug of war that's going to happen on the home front with those with the war abroad and this uh, these programs at home. So battle for racial equality, I mean could very well be this entire slide. Um, the next couple, I mean, like I said, the, this whole this whole lecture is so important. Um, Green, uh, even if it's not heavily tested on the APUSH exam, understanding the entire movement as a whole, which, you know, we talked about in the last chapter, which kind of stem originally kind of starts with the Montgomery bus boycott and Rosa Parks getting arrested. Um, but it, it continues on, okay? We're in the 60s now. Greensboro, North Carolina, there was a sit-in uh, at a Woolworths at a segregated ca uh, counter at a, a Woolworths restaurant and four black students decided to sit at the counter instead of sitting in the uh, segregated area. And this will inspire sit-ins across the country, um, in churches, bowling alleys, um, other restaurants that segregated or no, or had signs that said no blacks allowed and they just would go in and protest peacefully. You have the Congress of a Racial Equality Corps uh, who enlisted these freedom riders north from white people and African-Americans from the North and South who wanted to challenge segregation on interstate buses in the South, okay? So they wanted to test to see if how segregated interstate travel is and was and if they could desegregate it. You have James Meredith, who is a 28 year old uh, black Air Force veteran who registered at the University of Mississippi. Uh, and at the time, this is a heavily, the South is still heavily segregated even though Brown versus the Board of Education kind of eliminates this, we saw yesterday that, you know, there'd still be resistance uh, from allowing desegregation to occur. And so Kennedy uh, got the National Guard involved to restore order to allow James Meredith to go to college there. You have a guy named Eugene Bull Connor, who was the what he was the mayor of Birmingham. And the mayor, the Birmingham is one of the uh, largely segregated cities in the South. And uh, he used fire hoses and attack dogs to break up protesters protesting segregation in the city. And this would be uh, televised. Um, that's where like television comes to hurt some of these uh, racist people uh, because it was these ha the response that they were doing. You know, you have protesters of all ages, not just you know twenty five to forty year olds protesting. You have teenagers and using powerful fire hoses on teenagers or attack dogs, it's, it's unneeded, right? It's not necessary. Uh, and that violence was displayed for all of America to see. You have uh, the letter from Birmingham jail. Martin Luther King gets arrested. And um, I actually had to read this book in, in college uh, in my U in my U.S. history college class, and this drew on Henry David Thoreau's and Gandhi's ideas of civil disobedience. We talked about that last chapter. Governor George Wallace of Alabama 
vowed to avoid desegregation at the University of Alabama. And um, again, the National Guard is going to enforce this. And um, he vowed to stand in the doorway of University of Alabama, but after he gave his speech, he stepped aside. And now Kennedy realized he could no longer negotiate on the issue of civil rights and now started to campaign for civil rights. Um, I guess you kind of make that comparison to um, Abraham Lincoln in a sense where, uh, all right, here are the pictures. Uh, this is James Meredith. This is, of course, Martin Luther King Jr. and his mugshot. This is Bull Connor, looks like a racist. And then you have, uh, this is Gen Governor George Wallace right here, um, standing in front of the doorway. So like I was saying, it was kind of, it's kind of similar. I, I, you know, how Kennedy, not Kennedy, Lincoln, um, you know, when he first got elected, just campaigned on preserving the union um, and not focusing on ending slavery because that probably wouldn't have gotten him elected, right? Um, and then shortly after the war, uh, the war starts, you know, it becomes a campaign to end slavery. Uh, much like Kennedy is trying to tiptoe around the South and their discriminate, discriminatory policies. I, I say the South, it, it also happened across the North. You, you can't forget that people. Um, just can't always say the South, the South, the South, it still happened in the North. Um, look at the race riots in, in Chicago, in, in Detroit, okay? In Southern California, we'll get there soon. Okay, so discrimination is not just in the South. But the fact that Kennedy can no longer tiptoe and say, well, we'll make compromises on civil rights. Well, Kennedy now knows from all these protests, from all the discriminatory policies, from the televised um, abuse that teenagers, little kids, elderly, and all in between are getting uh fire hoses, which have, they're not like your regular hoses, okay? They have a lot of pressure and they're just using them and, and turning away protesters, trying to end this distraction, end this disruption, okay? And now Kenny's like, okay, we gotta make moves. So August 28th, 1963 is Martin Luther King's famous I Have a Dream speech from the March on Washington. Uh, the Sadly, uh, it's during this time that JFK gets assassinated. So his um, vice president, Linda B. Johnson, becomes president. And from LBJ, he passes the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which guaranteed equal access to public accommodations. And the government could cut off funds where discrimination occurred. So if you're a federally funded um, institution, that gets money from the federal government, they could cut off your supply because you're not, you, you have segregation policies. Uh, you have also the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which the federal government could register voters and it eliminated literacy tests for voting. And then you have the 24th Amendment, which would eliminate poll taxes. So it's not even until, it's until the 60s that poll taxes and literacy tests are eliminated. Just, just think about that, a hundred years, a lifetime. A, a, I mean, that's more than an average person's lifetime, okay? A hundred years of segregation. It's tough. <laughs> it's the civil rights, it's big, it's big now. Talk about it was big then, it's, it's big now, okay? Especially in the last year, okay? Th this, it is what it is, all right? 
So you have two types of discrimination. Uh, you have de jure discrimination, which is discrimination by laws, like, you know, Jim Crow. And those soon would become illegal, obviously. And then you have de facto discrimination, which is discrimination by custom and tradition. And that's where you kind of have this idea of white supremacy, you know, that's going on in America. And that's much harder to eliminate because people grow up in these types of societies, these neighborhoods, these cultures, all right? And, and it's hard to change. It's tough to change, but change needs to happen. So in 1965, you have uh, the Watts riot in uh, the Los Angeles suburb of Watts. Uh, it's a six day riot, 34 people will die. Other racial riots will occur across other countries. Uh, you have the idea of black power, uh, which is a movement, quote, from away from interracial cooperation. So um, if you're thinking like from Booker T. Washington, uh -uh. Um, Martin Luther King, and toward an increased awareness of racial distinctiveness. And it was actually inspired by Marcus Garvey from the 1920s, okay? You have the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Com Committee, or SNCC, uh, which later under the leadership of Stokely Carmichael, they will focus on black power uh, in their in their um, in their committee, their programs. And it's also good to note that Martin Luther King was also a part of this before, you know. Uh, you have the Black Panthers are formed out here in California, uh, in Oakland. Uh, under the leadership of Huey Newton and Bobby Seale, and they will advocate for the arming of blacks against the white police. And we can't talk about the civil rights movement without talking about our, our guy, Malcolm X. Um, and he advocated for black revolution and black separatism. Okay. And it's good to know that yes, he he changed his his views to advocating for violence, which often uh, contrasts to Martin Luther King Jr.'s you know nonviolence, you know civil disobedience style protests, um, but also this idea of black separatism where blacks should only buy from black companies, black stores, black restaurants, putting their money into the black community. That's that idea of black separatism. It's going to appeal to a lot of frustrated African-Americans who, yes, follow and, and you know, I'm not going to say adore MLK, but some people get frustrated with all the nonviolence protests that don't seem to go and push the limits that they think they can. And so they're going to see Malcolm X and what he is authorizing, authorizing what he's standing for. And those frustrated uh, African-Americans are going to start to follow him. Uh, and sadly, Malcolm X was assassinated February 1965. So here's a picture from the Watts, riot, Watts riots in LA. Here's Stokely Carmichael. And here's an actual picture of Martin Luther King meeting with Malcolm X. And this is the only time they will ever meet in person. So they largely get compared and contrasted to uh, during this time. And turns out they only ever met once. All right, so now we're going to focus on JFK's foreign policy. And for those of you who had me last year, well, this will come up as some sort of review, um, but let's get into it. So his foreign policy was flexible response, which is largely different than Eisenhower's massive retaliation brinkmanship that we talked about 
in the last lecture. And he would develop a plan to find new ways of combating the Cold War. Uh, instead of building up the military, you know, trying to use covert operations. Uh, the Green Berets, who are heavily um, militarized, uh, trained uh, soldiers, will develop under JFK. You have his Alliance for Progress, where billions of American dollars were pledged to improve the economies in Latin America. And one of his last theme uh, programs that still exists today was the creation of the Peace Corps, right? And these are young Americans that would serve 24 months overseas as doctors, teachers, nurses, the, et cetera. And they focused on the social and economic development of those places where they went abroad. Uh, and it hoped to improve countries and resist communism. Because now you see, oh, America is helping us out. America cares about us and you know to a degree yeah it's a little a little propaganda ish but that was you know he was trying to make a humanitarian effort to you know show the good that democracy can have so you can resist communist uh followings in your countries and then you have the bay of pigs invasion which was a huge Hell, you're, if, if, you, if you know Step Brothers, you know that scene. Uh, and these were Cuban exiles that were trained by the U.S. that would invade Cuba because they were tired of Fidel. April 1961, the invasion takes place. It's a, trying to do like a sea landing like D-Day. Uh, Fidel Castro knew um, and there was supposed to be United States air support, but the air support was never authorized. It doesn't come. And it's just a big fat failure. And everyone knows it's the U.S. that gets involved. So that is one of the blemishes to uh, JFK's um, presidency. Its impact, Cuba and the Soviet Union would now worry about future invasions, which will come up very soon. Here's the Peace Corps. Here's uh, JFK giving a speech in, in uh, Latin America, and here's the area of the Bay of Pigs. So continuing on, you have the Berlin Wall. Again, do, do not mix up the Berlin Wall with the Berlin Airlift. Um, Stalin cuts off railroad, all road entry into Berlin. So therefore, Berlin, West Berlin is cut off from the rest of the world. That's where the Berlin airlift comes into play under Truman. The Berlin Wall is the physical wall that is built because between 1949 and 1961, over two and a half million East Germans will flee Soviet-controlled East Germany through West Berlin. And... August 13, 1961, the Soviets began the construction of the wall, Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, on October 14, 1961, or was it, it was 1962, um, U.S. surveillance discovered missiles with nuclear capabilities in Cuba. And the assumption was it could largely destroy most of the United States, especially on the East Coast, on average, uh, they estimated 80 million people could die if these were detonated on our country. You know, Cuba isn't that far away from the United States. So JFK will quarantine Cuba, N not allow any other Soviet ships in. It's going to lead to a standoff. And uh, it's going to be 13 days of what ifs. Oh my God, what, 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 it's just a lot of stress um, and a very, the probably the closest, if you talk about brinkmanship, the closest we've ever gotten to another war or nuclear war in the United States history. So we eventually came to a compromise and the Soviet Union would withdraw their missiles and support from Cuba as long as the U.S. promised not to attack Cuba, as well as the U.S. also would withdraw their missiles from Turkey, which were pointed right at Russia or right at the Soviet Union. 
And um, yeah, in this impact, there would be a hotline established between our two countries if there were ever a need to make some make a call uh our our white house would easily connect with the kremlin in in the soviet union so here here's some soviet ships the quarantining and here's uh the geog the photos taken from u2 spy plane so agony of vietnam so Vietnam is going to be talked about in the next chapter as well, but good to know um, the synopsis of it. Dien Bien Phu falls in 1954, as we talked about last time, and France withdrew from French Indochina, aka Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia. And the U.S. presence in Vietnam increased because of the idea of the domino theory that if one country falls in the area to communism, all the other dominoes will fall. To communists, and we did not. We did not want that. We saw what happened in Korea. We saw what happened in China, and we saw what could happen in Turkey and Greece. We know, so we stick our nose in places that didn't belong. North Vietnam, communists. South Vietnam, non-communists. Ho Chi Minh, No Dinh Diem. Uh, North and South Vietnam divided at the 17th parallel. And you need to know this. The reason we escalate is this Gulf of Tonkin resolution where American ships were supposedly attacked. And this would provide a blank check for Johnson to get more involved in Vietnam. And it will, this Gulf of Tonkin resolution will increase presidential powers during the war. So here's this map of the Gulf of Tonkin incident in North Vietnam. So traumas of 1968, 1968, bad year. You have the Tet Offensive, which is the Vietnamese New, Vietnamese New Year. And it was a attack, an all out attack from North Vietnam invading South Vietnamese cities where Americans largely caught off guard um, because it is their new year. They didn't think that they would be attacked. Well, they were wrong. And this is going to lead to an increase in opposition to the war. Yes, the U.S. resists, but a lot of people are dying. People aren't liking what's happening. We need to get out. So Johnson declared, he, he knew um, by escalating our um, interference in Vietnam, uh, he, his popularity is largely declining. He said he wouldn't run for re-election in 1968. So also in 1968, two assassinations. April 4th, Martin Luther King is assassinated in, uh, was it Mississippi? Uh, riots will break out throughout the country. People are upset. And June 6th, uh, Robert F. Kennedy, RFK, would be assassinated as well. And this is like uh, very sad because there was a future for Robert Kennedy as everyone, everyone loved his brother, JFK. And there was promise for the future for his younger brother. Sadly, he also gets assassinated. Democratic Convention of 1968, there were protests over the Vietnam War and police and protesters, demonstrators, will clash at this convention. And the election in 1968, uh, George Wallace runs as a third party candidate, hoping to win the Southern votes. He'll run on a segregation, anti-great society, anti-protesting platform. And if it hasn't been discussed yet, Third party candidates usually steal votes from their supposed party, whether it's Republican or Democrat, and those followers that, the, that they run on, you know, if it's a little extreme or radical conservative, um, they take votes away. And so this leads, uh, you know, Richard Nixon is also running for president again, and he runs on a campaign peace without, without, with honor. And so Nixon defeats a uh, Democrat, um, Democrat candidate, Hubert Humphrey, 
301 to 191. So uh, since George Wallace stole votes from Hubert Humphrey, allowed Nixon to win. Get the hell out of Vietnam. That's what I'm talking about. All right. So whew, uh, that was a long lecture. That was a heavy, heavy notified lecture. I'm sorry. It's just so important. Okay. It's just important to know. And, you know, as historians, we kind of don't want the past to repeat itself. So, yeah, there you go. All right. Um, Hopefully you did enjoy that. If you did, make sure you uh, hit that like button for your boy. And as always, stay safe, wash your hands. Peace.